All right. So our third video of this section is going to focus like it did for Japan, the expansion of Italy. And again, it's these specific events. Um, I think an important thing to note is that Mussolini is a part of the European political ecosystem for about a decade before he, he and Italy engage in this campaign of uh, expansion and disruption. Um, so like, keep that in mind that like Italy comes upon, like they, they have their fascistic revolution far uh, earlier than, um, than these other states, but still eventually get called out uh, or be, or kind of go on these campaigns of expansion. So here's our map of the Italian empire. Uh, not to dig at Italians, Italy so much, but it's kind of a tiny empire compared to the other European states, right? Uh, you have Libya, which we actually know the story of how they got Libya in the Italo-Turkish War. Um, the focus will mainly be um, Ethiopia, it's going to be Albania, and um, some drama they get involved with in Spain as well, okay? So, um, first we're going to talk about the goals of exp expansionism, and these, this all occurs post-Great Depression, so again, we cannot discount the influence of the Great Depression in Italian expansion. Um, and so uh, Italy and, and uh, specifically the fascist party is experiencing a lot of instability as a consequence of the Great Depression. Uh, like every government is, 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 is at the time, right? The Weimar government in Germany, the American government, right? We have an election in 1929 that ends up deposing by a massive mandate the Republican Party to bring FDR into power. And so one um, goal of Italian expansion, sorry, and the Italian government is trying to hold on to their power as well. The fascists are trying to hold on to their power as well. And so one goal of expansion would be to, to direct um, attention outward from Italy that tr trying to resolve these issues in the Italian economy uh, by expanding or saying that expansion will fix it, right? And also, domestic economic policy inside of Italy didn't really do much to fix it. Um, they wanted to expand to the Balkans and the Mediterranean because that's also where they believed that it Italy had a right to possess, right? Uh, and, and sometimes... Um, Italy uses this imagery of expansion, um, of, of kind of re, returning the Roman Empire to Europe uh, through the Italian state. And they have a concept that you'll become more familiar with when we talk about Germany, but Spazio Vitale, which is essentially living space, which if you know anything about Nazis yet, Lebensraum, which is German for living space, is um, this is the nationalistic articulation of expansionism, that um, the Italian people are entitled to have a, a surplus of space, space with which to propagate and uh, what do you call it? Procreate and things like that. Um, and so other causes would be the fact that fascism is a militaristic ideo ideology. So when Italy wants to expand, it's going to seek to expand through militaristic means. And then also it's going to adapt its foreign policy to align with states that would better enable an expansionist ideology like Germany, like Japan. Okay. And economics, already talked about it. So the first conflict we're going to talk about is the Italo-Abyssinian War from 1835 to 1936. And you're probably thinking, oh my God, he's introducing another place that has two names to it. It's like Anatolia, Turkey, and the Ottoman Empire. That Abyssinia, and actually we, use, we usually have Ethiopian students kind of every few years um, in, um, in, AB, in IB, actually. But um, Abyssinia and Ethiopia are the same thing. Um, Abyssinia, I think, is like the historical name for it. I actually don't know what, what the difference between names are. But when it could also be called the Italo-Ethiopian War. But the kind of more uh, noted nomenclature would be Abyssinian, okay? So in 1895, the Italians tried to cap capture Ethiopia. Because notably, after all the dust had settled from the Berlin Conference and all of Europe had gobbled up Africa and um, projected their influence throughout the continent... There were two countries that, or air regions, that were not occupied by foreign powers. Liberia, which is a country that was founded by um, 
manumitted slaves after the Civil War, and that sounds really cool, and that's a different history class, and it's more complicated than that. Because you know what they did when Liberians came to Africa? They did the American thing to indigenous Africans. Um, and then Ethiopia, which is a country that had been, is a Christian state that had been um, kind of independent for like since the time of the Roman Empire and things like that. Um, and they had were able to use their cultural connections to Christianity to leverage certain connections with the other European states. So when Italy tried to conquer Ethiopia, the only one of the few independent states left uh, in Africa, your other European states intervened and Ethiopia was able to defeat the Italians in 1895, okay? However, Italy did have possessions in Somalia, which is that territory right to the south of Ethiopia. And um, it called, was called Somaliland. What do you know? What is such an original name? And like what the Japanese do with both the Marco Polo bridges that didn't go into the, the uh, Sino-Japanese War, as well as the manufacturing of the Manchurian crisis, they fabricated a conflict over a region known as the YY Oasis, um, which uh, essentially was in Ethiopia, but the Italians built a fort in Ethiopia and the Ethiopians were like, um, hello? And uh, when they tried to get the Italians to move out of Ethiopia, that required force, which then the Italians were like, well, we should have been, we're here already and you try to attack us. And so that leads to a war. Um, but it does, the facts are not all clear in the moment. And so uh, the international community kind of stands by and watches. We're going to talk about that in a moment. Um, and uh, Italy kind of easily defeats the Ethiopian army because the global community was not as unified against um, expansionism. We'll talk about that in the next video as well. Um, now, Britain and France are not fans of this decision, but they do not directly intervene um, to stop them. Eventually, they engage in a type of uh, economic pressure on Italy, but it doesn't directly doesn't really stop the Abyssinian conflict from happening. Um, what happened as a consequence of the Italo-Abyssinian War, the second one, is that Mussolini gains legitimate legitimacy because he said he was going to make Italy stronger. He acquired territory. That territory hypothetically should leverage into increased power for Italy. The fact of the matter is that, you know, uh, pretty early in the war, uh, Italy loses Ethiopia to the uh, Allies. Another consequence of them is uh, expanding is not only is he more popular in Italy, but also uh, because this action pushes him away from countries that actually, ironically, were historically Italy's allies, like um, France and Great Britain, means that Mussolini begins to align more with the foreign policies and governments of Germany and Japan. Um, and another significant consequence of this would be that the League of Nations loses legitimacy in their failure to arbitrate this conflict um, and so uh, this, this is kind of like the Lighten Report in the Japanese series. Um, our next uh, conflict is the Spanish Civil War. Uh, I have taught it in the past, so I kind of have more to say about it. But um, it's also kind of different because um, this is kind of a failure of Italian expansion. So as a consequence of the war, uh, Spain divides into among kind of along two ideologies, two main ideologies. It's more complicated than that. Um, you have the royalists who eventually become the nationalists uh, uh, who seek to restore a, a, the Spanish monarchy to authority after a very short experiment with democracy. And then you have the elements of democracy in Spain, which are known as the Republicans, who were a coalition of less left-leaning political groups, as well as Marxists and anarchists in an interesting, in an interesting twist. Um, the Soviet Union supports started supporting the communist elements of the Republicans. So not all the Republicans, just most of the Republicans. Um, and then actively kind of weakening the non-communist elements of the Republican movement. Um, Mussolini, as we kind of learned about Italian fascism in the last video, is fervently anti-communist. And so he feared that the US, Soviet Union intervention in Spain would lead to a communist Spain. 
Um, and so in order to stop the spread of communism, Mussolini intervenes to help the nationalists against, um, against them. Uh, and why he wants to do that is that it is expansion because he's not going to take control of Spain. But hypothetically, if a fascist aligned ruler um, comes to power in Spain, that would give... Um, Italy, another ally that would then further enable their expansionist foreign policy, which would then further realize his goals of a stronger Italy, right? So uh, that that Spanish state hypothetically was more in the interest of Italian Italy's interest than a uh, leftist state, right? Um, and so he actually sends troops to help there's actually like a foreign troop involvement in the Spanish Civil War in which Italians actually fight with the nationalists and have some impact on the ultimate success of the nationalists and the ascension of the leader of the nationalists a man named Francisco Franco um so uh this this conflict was less popular among the among the Italian population um first of all uh Mussolini telling the population, we're spending all this money so that someone will be more ideologically aligned with us is not as compelling as we're going to own more stuff, right? Because people can get that. Like, we own more territory, we get a bigger economy, we become stronger. Having an ally that could help us in the near future disrupt the status quo that would enable our expansion, less easier to sell, right? Also, Franco is a nationalist. He's not a fascist. He's not, in many ways, I think, a reactionary conservative interested in projecting global influence in the same way that a Mussolini or a Hitler would. Um, notably, Spain stays neutral during World War II, mainly because this war is so catastrophic to Spain because so many people die on both sides. Um, so Italy spends a lot of stuff for very, very little. Uh, they don't get much in the end. They don't, even get a, they don't even get a really reliable ally in the long term of it. And then finally, the Germans, who are now Nazis, who have been Nazis since 33, um, get closer as a consequence of the Spanish Civil War. Um, Mussolini and Hitler are kind of in the same wheelhouse ideologically, except Italian nationalism and German nationalism. And also, uh, when he starts doing this, uh, Italy kind of withdraw, also withdraws from the League of Nations, right? They're kind of fully not participating in global co cooperation. That concept of collective security becomes even weaker, right? Because really important here is that, like, Mussolini actually... Italy was a member of the Security Council, right? The, or the... Not, it wasn't called the Security Council, but a key, a key element to collective security. When he leaves that... There's less involved, less less resources for the uh, the League of Nations to check any other malevolent actor, right? So Japan leaves, Italy leaves, and now we're going into this phase leading up to World War II, where there are less people involved in checking uh, states that seek to challenge the non-expansionist status quo, right? And uh, our final um, element of this is uh, in the ah, in 37. Um, boy, I hope I my gut is saying 37, but it might be 38. I'm pretty sure it's 37. Um, Hitler has some drama with Czechoslovakia. He almost fights a war with Czechoslovakia. The world, the global community, gives Germany a the part of Czechoslovakia. We'll talk about this more in detail in the next series on Germany, next week on Germany. Um, uh, in an agreement called the Munich Agreement, so this territory gives uh, Germany what he wants, what Hitler what he wants, Germany what they want, and uh, then subsequently after the Munich Agreement is signed, Hitler just ignores it and dismantles Czechoslovakia, and Mussolini is like, you're allowed to just ignore international treaties like that? And so, um, you know, uh, Albania is a country that kind of we talked about a little bit with World War in the Middle East. They're kind of one of the key points of drama in the uh, Balkan War. 
because uh, they declare they they kind of revolt against the Ottomans that they joined the Balkan League during the war itself. Um, and as a consequence of like its size and the volatility of the Balkans, Albania is essentially a satellite under Italy, led by a man named King Zog, which is a pretty cool name. Um, and then Zog isn't necessarily happy with his arrangement. When he tries to assert independence, Italy just beats them down. And then Italy is occup- Albania is occupied by the Italians, as it's becoming a part of, uh, of Italian territory. Um, and so those, those are our three examples of Italian expansion. Um, our final video, which I will probably not do today, is going to be about Ital- the global response to these three examples. Well, probably more of these uh, two examples. Um, in that next video. So I'll see you guys then.